Yeah, you know what? Quick tip for uh, prospective babysitters. If you show up and it turns out you're not actually watching a kid, run! Inside number nine, episode six of series one, the finale of series one, and for at least the foreseeable future, the last one of these that I'm going to do a uh, individual review on. I do plan to keep watching the show. I probably won't do episode by episode reviews. I might if like I feel a really particular need I have to talk about uh, any given episode, but that's the plan right now. Anyways, this is The Harrowing. And this is an episode that a lot of people seem to not have much affection for, um, judging by my own comment section at the very least. So what can I say about this? Well, it's uh, it's atmospheric. It goes hard in on the uh, on the gothic horror angle. There is absolutely no doubt about that. Premise wise, uh, in case you're watching this without having seen the thing, I don't know why you would, but just in case, we have uh, a teenage girl show. You know, this is obviously all set in London, showing up at a, at a very old house that is in a cellular dead zone. That she uh, she's booked for a babysitting gig, and she gets there, and she's not really watching a baby she's just watching a house as these two siblings who live there um you know head out for an evening and leave the house with just her and their older um disabled sibling who is confined to his room alone in the house and it is as creepy and atmospheric as that setup requires. There's never any doubt that this is a bad situation. That's sort of the nature of gothic horror, because when you're doing different stripes of horror, you approach it in different ways. You know, the, the way that something like, uh, say, you know, The Exorcist was scary was that it took place in a home that felt like it could be the home of anybody viewing it. When you do something like this, you need to lean in hard on the fact that this is wrong and this is bad right off the bat because there's no disguising it. So you might as well lean hard into it. And honestly, I, I enjoyed most of this. Um, I'll mention what I didn't enjoy. We'll get there. But it seemed very clear to me that this was, that this is a bit of a loving send up and a bit of a parody of, you know, the hammer horror style and, and gothic, you know, stor horror storytelling in general, because it is so on the, the, the point at which I felt I could safely label it parody uh, was when the character of Hector showed up, um, you know, who's, who's kind of living in, he's, he is, you know, ridiculously pale with these sunken eyes and this washed out hair and these long nails and it's and and the voice of the I'm not a vampire if that's what you were afraid of it's it, it really rides that line where it is so ridiculous you can't help but laugh at it yet at the same time I could still believe that that performance would actually be given in a gothic horror movie circa, I don't know, 1962 or something. I could I could buy this and that's and that's the that's the best kind of parody, the best kind of pastiche is to have it be passable as the thing you're kind of jabbing fun at. Um, because if it's if it doesn't even look like the thing you're making fun of, then you're just doing it wrong. So, and it, it does actually get some genuine tension out of some of its moments as well. Um, you know, the build up to a lot of it. Uh, and and it's, it's going along pretty well. I get, it's not blowing me away, but I'm going, I kind of do this. I feel like I'm on this thing's wavelength. Uh, right up until it got to the ending. And normally I'd spoiler this. I suppose I will anyways. I'll kind of mention it, but it, you can't really spoil this ending because it doesn't really have one just kind of stops. It, it stops at the very least a scene before this story should have ended. And I think I get what they were trying to go for in terms of where they cut it off, but you need to be telling a very specific kind of story to get away with cutting off before the end the way this cuts off before the end. So like, an example of something that does it well, I've mentioned this before, the series finale. Well, you know, I won't mention that because that'll be considered spoilers. This is spoilerish too, but it maybe it's something that I think most people will have seen. So the ending of The Grey. 
um, I love, and somewhat notoriously, and this upset some uh, audience members, it ends right before um, the Liam Neeson wolf fight that was in all that you know the lead up to was in the trailers. It cuts to black. It cuts to black and goes to credits right at the end, and it works there because thematically, what the story is doing, whether or not he wins that fight doesn't matter. What matters is that he chose to fight instead of just lay down and accept the inevitable. That is what is important. The outcome of the fight is not nearly as important in terms of the story that the film is telling. This doesn't have that kind of setup where you can cut off before the end because where it ultimately ended up wasn't the point. This didn't pull that off, so it didn't earn ending before it had ended. And that that is sort of the fall down on this because I was digging. I, I'll just talk specifics from here on out since I've already talked about the ending. So, um, you know, more spoilers, I guess. Um, I was digging pretty much all the rest of it. There were a lot of neat little touches that I liked. I really liked the the friend, the goth teenage friend, and the twist of her being uh, involved with the uh, with the sort of cult thing that was going on. That worked for me, especially since like it wasn't a complete heel turn on her character. From what little you know we spent, what little time we spent with her, I under I felt like I understood her character well enough to. Oh no, this makes sense. So it didn't it didn't have the usual problem that oh they were. A villain usually has which is that suddenly you don't know them as a character anymore it's like no this makes sense this is consistent i dug that there was a there was one little moment i loved uh which was when the sister gets hit with the taser gun and you know she's up against the wall and like right before she slumps down the wall she just kind of huh. and i'm just it's just this quick little moment i'm like you enjoyed that a little bit, didn't you? And it's touches like that that I actually really enjoy. And there is a creepiness to it. I think the moment of, you know, wait, his hands are tied, who rang the bell? That was a good moment. And uh, I think the timing of that was planned well. So I really, I was digging this. Again, I wasn't like blown away by it, but I was digging this. I was having fun with it until it just failed to end. I don't... I don't know why. I don't know why they thought that was the place to end. Like, I guess another episode from the same series, Sardines kind of feels like it, maybe it ends before the ending because we don't know whether or not um, that character actually lights the fire. But again, that, it we don't need to know that. What's important is realizing who he is and what and how damaged he is and by whom what his final choice to do about that does not actually matter uh, as far as revelations go and the and the other thing is this doesn't even end on a revelation it just ends on something that had been built up to for like the last 10 minutes before that thing that it was built up to actually happened it's really it's weird i i don't know what they were going for with just cutting it off at the end like that. There isn't much more to say about it beyond that, so I guess what I'll do wrapping up here is I quickly give my ranking for the first six episodes of this show. So my favorite episode, easily, was Sardines, the very first episode of this season. I really enjoyed that. That was super well structured. Um, just really intelligently put together. Um, second favorite episode would be Tom and Jerry. Uh, which was the third episode. Uh, after that, it would be The Understudy, uh, which I know a lot of people don't seem to like that much, but I enjoyed because I'm, I'm a sucker for what I feel is fairly well done backstage and you know depiction of actors. Um, then I'll put The Harrowing after that. And then at, for as frustrating as my issues were with it, I would put A Quiet Night in. Um, Next, because I, I do think Last Gasp has to go at the bottom just for the laziness of it. Like the initial premise is interesting enough, but then what it does is the laziest possible option with that premise. While I did not like A Quiet Night In, it at least had a little bit more ambition, if only from the gimmick of it being a, um, a nearly silent episode. So there you go. In any case, I think that'll, that'll wrap it up. And as I said, this will be the last Inside Number 9 review that I'm planning. 
Um, like I said, I may or may not come back and talk about specific episodes uh, if and when I get to them. If they, if they make me feel like I really need to talk about it, we'll see. But for now, that's going to be it, folks. So what were your thoughts on The Harrowing? How would you rank the entirety of Series 1? Or your thoughts on the show in general? Whatever they are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. There's all that stuff to do. You know what it is. There's buttons and links and stuff. I have a Patreon, and there's a bunch of other things as well. If you care, you can check it out down in the description. And remember, folks, you are the council. I just run the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned.